Kia ora, no mai, haere mai, and welcome to another edition of Aotearoa Rugby Pod and what is a very sad time for New Zealand and world rugby with the unexpected passing, tragic passing of Chiefs and Māori All Blacks winger Sean Wainui. Uh, I haven't dealt with them a lot, but people on our panel have, and there's Bryn Hall and from Christchurch, and of course James Parsons in Auckland, and Bryn, uh, a deeply sad moment for everyone who knows him. Yeah, yeah, it is, mate. It's um, yeah, it's tough any time you hear um, a devastating news of, of what we've heard around around Sean. And you know, first and foremost, you know, I want to send my love to um, the Wainui family. Um, grew up with his brother Luke, and um, you know, I've known Sean for a very long time, and ended up knowing his his, his parents and his and his extended family, and then to his beautiful wife Paige and his beautiful kids. Um, you know, and the sad news you hope to think that you know um, nothing else will happen, and thankfully, you know, they're safe. And um, it's just really unfortunate for a guy like Sean who. Um, as such a great man, um, just went into um, from being a young Maori kid, um, being really rough around the edges, around the edges, and then um, you know spending a lot of time with him growing up during the school schoolboy system, um, and then at the Crusaders spending a bit of time with him, and then throughout the Maori um, campaigns, any time I got to connect him, he was such a lovely man, and um, and I knew how much his family meant to him, and um, with Paige and those kids, and how much it meant to him, so. Um, yeah, I just want to send my condolences to everybody that knows Sean and um, we're all thinking of him and just really fortunate that I got to meet a, a lovely man and um, was part of such a beautiful family and, um, you know, rest, um, definitely rest in peace, Shorty boy. What was the essence of Sean, Brenner? Like, what made him so special? Just, yeah, whatever you saw with him was, was how he was. He wore, wore his heart on his sleeve and, uh, you know, it was really massive around his, his Maori culture and, and whether we're, whether, whenever we're in the Māori culture or the Māori team, um, you know, he was a massive advocate around that. You know, he'd, he loved being Māori. He loved talking about his heritage and where he'd come from. And then um, just through the time knowing him, you know, when we were younger, it was a little bit rough around the edges. Around the edges, but you know, that was what I loved about Sean. And then um, having his beautiful, meeting his beautiful partner Paige, and having and having his kid, his little boy as well, and his kids, um, and seeing that growth in his development and, and how he was as a, as a person. So. Um, it's in life, you know, every time you, you evolve and you continue to be a better person of yourself. And I was really fortunate to see Sean from a young, really young age and then to be able to see a great family man and um, had so much love for his family and his kids, which, you know, it just comes back to how much of a great person that he was. And James, a hell of a rugby player. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I was on the receiving end of some of his brilliance. Um, one of the memories I have, uh, there was an offload that sort of went towards his feet and he sort of hacky sacked the ball back up to himself and scored. Uh, a, a pretty crucial try against uh, the Blues when, when we were having a fierce battle down in Hamilton. And I think the other testament to, to Sean is, I suppose, how wide-reaching his touch has been. Um, it's certainly impacted the whole rugby community and, and everyone's thinking of um, his whanau and, and his family and his friends in this tough time. Yeah, yeah, Bryn, you played a lot with him. You know, what did he bring as, as I suppose, as a footy player? What was the difference between him and other players you played with, with his skills on the field and, and the things he could do? Oh, just just reliable, real real consistent, um, such a consistent player. You know, wasn't the most fastest guy, but you knew a guy that would always um, do his homework, understand what his role is within a game, and, and was tough as well. You know, had some really tough ball carries, um, was a great ball carrier, and his, defensively as well. He had some real good physicality around putting shots on and, you know, being that kind of talisman of that defensive leader and trying to get um, teams into the game, us into the game due to his um, defensive pressure. So um, those are the things that, that I definitely saw with Sean. But um, for me, I think just his growth around um, him getting better as a rugby player and had such a growth mindset, which not, you know, a lot of players do have. And, um, you know, Sean was definitely one of those guys that had that ability, wanting to grow consistently as a rugby player and wanting to get better, which is, you know, that's probably the reason why he was a professional rugby player for uh, for so many years and so many teams. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose it's one of those things, such young men, such huge futures ahead of them. You know, we've seen a few pass recently. We had Jerry pass too soon. Zioni pass too soon. Now we've had Sean pass too soon. Um, Chipper, what does the rugby community do to, to get through this? You know, what will the Players Association do to help everyone carry on through such a tragedy? Oh, it's not just about the Players Association. I think it's a collaborative approach with um, his, his teams he's involved in and, and NZR. And uh, they'll, they'll make sure that, you know, there's, there's good support networks and systems put across the rugby community um, to make sure everyone's uh, looked after from an individual point of view and an organisation-wide point of view. 
I don't know how to move on from that within the show because it's, you know, it's such a sad, sad moment and, and so very sudden. But our thoughts go out to the Wainui family, anyone who's known and is friends with Sean, and uh, all the best as you go through this tough time. Uh, moving on from there to to other rugby. Um, I'm not sure quite how we do that, but um, I suppose one of the other big pieces of news this week is, is Liam Squire. Um, he's decided to um, move on from a knee injury into the next part of his life, um, a persistent knee injury. Uh, Jipper, a hell of a player too, like a guy with some serious physical nature to him. He brought a lot to the All Black jersey and a lot to the Highlanders jersey. Oh, absolutely did. Um, and even his time with his Chiefs, uh, he was he was really effective and, and we know how he um, loved playing for the Mako as well. So everywhere he's gone, he's um, definitely been one of the better players and not only was he that enforcer, I think the, the beauty of Liam is, is that he could go between those games. He had some real X factor about him. He had that turn of pace, that sort of explosive athlete um, skill set. And, and uh, he, he knew when to you know do the tight stuff, but also could show his wears out on that edge. And uh, as, as we know, the sixth jersey in the All Blacks is always a big enforcer role. Um, and he certainly left no stone unturned when he, when he wore that uh, black six and every other jersey that um, he wore. Uh, before getting to that that level and he was a hell of an athlete too there's a couple of memories i have of him playing for the all blacks i think particularly in sydney one year it might have been 2016 or 2017 and flying down the left hand side Brent, he was a guy who actually had a fair bit of toe he did he made me look silly a few times as well we, we, we joke around this podcast with Artie Sevier and how many nightmares i have before Artie, there was liam so um yeah for me who was um just really explosive. We, we talk around his attacking ability and like you said, Ross, um, an open, especially on the edge plays and being able to get um, free-flowing ball and being able to build up a bit of speed with how much a bit of turn of pace he did have. It was his physical side for me that I thought was a massive difference. We talk about the enforcer with what Jerome Kano brought to the jersey and Jerry Collins around that enforcer, that number six role. Liam Squire fitted right into that and, you know, there were a lot of injuries, due to, possibly a few injuries due to the how um, how physical and his kind of mindset when it came to the defensive side of the ball because you know every time he put a shoulder on or tried to hit somebody, you really felt it and you kind of knew going into a game that you'd have to watch out with both ways, looking both ways, knowing if Liam Squire was what was around there because of his defensive mindset and how um, physical he was. So, um, yeah, a really a really great man, a great a great man that played a lot of great rugby for for two teams, obviously with the All Blacks and then again with the Highlanders. Who um, you know he obviously came back because how much love he has for that club and you know we know as well how much he loves the Marcos and been able to put on that Tasman jersey. So yeah, um, definitely a, a play that's going to be well celebrated and um, you know looking forward to seeing what his future looks like uh, moving forward because he had such a great rugby career at the Highlanders and the All Blacks. Yeah, yeah, and there is a hole there at the number six jersey because he seemed to have a hold in it for a couple of years before the injuries came in. Uh, who is that person? Is it Shannon Frizzell coming back into this side? Probably maybe to play the United States this weekend, Jipper. That is the guy at the moment who could be there. Is it your boy Akira? Like, who who has this long-term jersey? Well, I think you have to say it's in Akira's own destiny at the moment, isn't it? He's performed extremely well. Not only people sort of just think about this season, but, you know, he had a really strong finish to last season as well which gave him first rights I suppose to the jersey um, you know this year and and he's continued that on with even better performances and, and some career best form in the All Black jersey so he's definitely um, a front runner but as we always say with this loose forward trio I don't think there's ever a chance that you can sit back and, and relax uh, because there is so much um, you know, I suppose energy from the people behind you wanting to sniff in the same jersey. Shannon Frizzell won. Ethan Blackadder, we all know um, what he's done. Dalton Papali can play all three. Um, Artie Savia can go there with Sam Kane coming back. So it, it will be a hotly contested jersey at six, but I think it's going to be hotly contested six, seven, and eight. Uh, so whoever gets the opportunity, um, I, I suppose that's the biggest way to look at it is, is if you're wearing it that week, uh, you can only add to. Uh, your situation or you can um, give other guys opportunities so you so I think every training counts but every every opportunity in that black six is, is, is going to be huge for moving into next season but when they get into next next season I think they'll be wanting to sharpen down and, and have a real clear picture of who's going to who's going to be the um, predominant selection in that six building into 2023. Mm. That probably stands as the big thing about this USA game for All Blacks fans, probably because the result is obviously a foregone conclusion. 
Um, Brenna, when you look at this weekend, the prospect of Sam Whitelock playing again, the prospect of Dan Coles playing again, possibly of Shannon Frizzell, it is that opportunity to show your wares this weekend, isn't it? Geez, those, yeah, those names are exciting, isn't it? Considering, you know, they haven't played it. It just comes back to the depth that we do have. And so, yeah, it is. It's a great opportunity for those guys to be able to, to, be able to play. And um, like you said, um, a lot of men have played really well consistently around the rugby championship and um, getting some really good minutes at And some guys haven't. You know, you look at the guys like Finlay Christie, you know, Quinta Pai, who played really well in that, um, that Tongan game and then made a really good steal um, in the game when he came off the bench. And so it's been able to give those guys opportunities to be able to play in a meaningful game. And so um, this US, that USA game for the likes of Dane Coles, uh, Sam Wattlock, who haven't played a lot of rugby, played, might have, uh, sorry, Bunnings, NPC, if they can come on and play an international game before going into the to the Northern, Northern Hemisphere. So I think it's a really good time for those guys. They are going to get opportunities from what all words, all words or, or accounts going to be is that it's going to be a fresh squad and guys are going to be given opportunities. But... I think you've got to take that opportunity as well because um, there's just so much depth within the squad, and if you know if you don't take your opportunity with what it is, um, then you're probably not going to get another opportunity in a big test match that, that there are at the back end of this Northern Hemisphere tour. So, um, a lot of competition, a lot of opportunity, and um, that's probably a great thing going into the American American game that guys are going to get that. But then I think as well, overall for the All Blacks team as well, like we've said, people are going to think it's a foregone conclusion, and you know you'd like to think that the All Blacks will um, will win that game convincingly, but. You know, for me, it's more so you look at that Tongan game when they played the Tongan, the Tongan team. And I see, I see Jip smiling now. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself there. But, you know, I'm just going to be honest with what I'm thinking around that. Because, look, the Americans haven't been the New Zealanders. They are going to play in America. But my expectation is that they're going to win comfortably. And so, for me, moving forward is how can they do that? You look at the Tongan experience they had. They, wanna, they didn't let them have a lot of momentum. So, when they don't have momentum, they're not always going to have it. For the majority of the game, they could. But I guess for the All Blacks and how ruthless and their, how clinical they want to be, it's been able to been able to stunt the growth of the Americans of when they do have the they have the momentum. And so, you know, it could be a hundred points game, it could be a seventy points game, or it could be real, you know, twenty points game, or it could be close. Who knows what it is? But I think for the All Blacks, that ruthlessness surrounding around, yep, executing what we can, but then stunting the momentum of the Americans when they do have it, and then being able to pounce and being able to turn it to their own momentum in their own favour moving forward. You can see big pictures of Bryn Hall on the wall of the Eagles dressing room now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have to, um, I tend to agree with you, Bryn, and I think that the Tongan test match is, a, is actually a perfect example of probably what they expect, and, and I, it's mm. the clinical nature. If you look through the rugby championship, um, in the first 30 minutes of most of their games, they had plenty of opportunities, but their skill execution or error rate was quite high and they didn't, um, I suppose, capitalize on the amount of possession and pressure they had into points. I know they won the rugby champions, but the All Blacks have such high standards on themselves. That's the, Those are the sort of things they'll be looking at. So I think that the set piece will be a, a, a big area that they focus on. Your breakdown stats around your lightning quick ball um, and your effectiveness to get bodies to ground and allow your opportunities to get turnovers. Um, and, and their defense has been really hard to break down uh, for tries, but where they probably have uh, pushed the boundary too far is is the penalties, and that's let teams like South Africa stay in touch uh, through that rugby championship. So, so probably decreasing the amount of penalties, uh, being really clinical in those attack, those key attacking stats. And, and look, uh, we spoke about when they played Tonga, how um, you know a lot of people said it was unfair, but you know you, you have to look at how hard that actually is to. Um, I suppose implement that, that sort of high skill level and that ruthless nature for such a long period and that that was you know people say it looks like a training run well sometimes you can't even do that at training against no opposition and they did it against a you know a motivated Tongan side so a performance like that is definitely what they'll be looking for they won't be focused on score lines uh, they'll, they'll be shaping their tour up um, in some key statistic areas that they probably didn't quite nail as much as they'd like um, in, in that rugby championship going into a big northern tour. And Brent, I think one thing that they probably learned last time they went to the United States, you know, when they were in Chicago and the Cubs were playing and the Blackhawks were playing and the Bulls were playing and there are all these distractions, they probably learned that now when they go there, they've got to put that to the side because they got probably too involved in that. And that could be a good thing for the way that they approach this week. Yeah, it is, but I think at the same time, it's been able to be enjoy that you're over there and not kind of um, shying away from it. It's embracing the fact that, you know, 
um, a lot of those guys wouldn't have been able to be in America just to the, due to the fact that the COVID situation and what's happening. So I think a lot of those boys will be really excited to be able to play. A lot of those guys love watching the NFL and being in, I love American sports and being able to be in those kind of stadiums to, to, to participate in a test match. It's only going to add fuel to them. So I think they will be really clear and have an understanding that, yes, there are going to be distractions, but you know, look, the All Blacks are pretty clear and have a great mental skills coach around being able to help them around there. They've got a great leadership group and a great coaching staff to be able to, like, look, say we're here for a job. They'll get that done, but at the same time, um, you know, you got to enjoy yourself and be surrounded with what's going to be going. You're going to, you're in a great part of the world, so I think they will get their right, and I think they will make the learnings of um, the test match you did say, um, um, Ross. But I think at the same time, it's embracing the cha- the, the chance to play in a, in a different part of the world. Um, a lot of av- like a lot of guys love love that kind of NFL, NBA kind of um, those kind of sports and games. So I think they'll get that right, and I don't see it being a problem um, coming this weekend. I'm not too sure yeah. if they'll get the chance because um, with the with the COVID protocols, I, I'm pretty sure they've got to be hotel bound um, and training pitch brown. So uh, they might be watching that that American sport from TV. <laughs> It'd be particularly <laughs> tough for Brad Weber, I would imagine. Yeah, oh, I look, but as Brad said, they all love it. They all love it. Um, but I'm not too sure. It might not be the case uh, in Washington, but um, I know that the COVID protocols are, are pretty strict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, speaking of strict and uh, decision making and discipline, as you mentioned before, Brody Retallick talked about decision making both on attack and at set piece as being major talking points for the All Blacks and a major improvement that's required during this tour. Is he spot on the money there, Jipper? Oh, look, I think, um, you know, they would have seen some key lineouts, not only in that last test match, but across where they went to the corner and didn't quite execute. And we know how ruthless, I suppose, All Black squads are on when they get into that 22 metre area, not to have, um, you know, white line fever as such and and be able to execute and and get their five pointer when they decided to go to the corner. So I'd say that's what he means in terms of uh, making sure they nail their attack line. I thought their scrum was um, really strong throughout. Uh, Again, very high standards, so they'll no doubt have some work ons in that area but uh, I think set piece with with guys like Sam Whitelock coming back into the team uh, you, you'll see a, a noticeable difference in, in their accuracy and I suppose their line out variation options and his ability to call space it's so much harder than it looks for, for um, line out callers to manipulate the defence to find that space and clear air for the hooker to throw in and, and the guys to jump into and he is just an absolute master of it and having him back in and around the environment will be crucial to that and then on attack, I suppose they're more alluding to, um, you know, the option taking in that last test around that rush defence. We've heard it before. Um, you know, they were effective in parts with kicks across the field and um, being able to get some bends on the edge when they get outside that rush D. Uh, but then we spoke about it um, in prior podcasts around when they had to turn back into guys like Marks and Co to, to be tackled and, and then turned over in key situations. So I'm sure that's what Brody will be getting at and making sure they get back to that, um, you know, real physical clinical nature around the breakdown. Because before that last South African test, we, we really spoke about what a growth that was in the All Black forward pack and from uh, last season to this season and, and their dominance and around that breakdown to provide the attacking opportunities for, for um, the guys out in the back line. And uh, they'll be looking to just bring that back in spades and, and keep it simple. When, when you keep footy simple, and you bring physicality, um, you know, the opportunities present themselves because you provide yourself time to make the better choices. Now, Bryn, looking at this roster over the next few weeks, or roster and schedule for the All Blacks over the next few weeks, we've got the USA, we've got a Welsh team that's depleted. We've got that return to Dublin, which is always the big one, Italy and finishing off in France. You know, when you look at these test matches, which one of these is the real biggie? Oh, for me, it's that it's that France game. Yeah, that's going to be the one for me. I think you know we got we got a real real lucky in that kind of um, Australian series. We've got a chance to see um, a, a French team with actually not a lot of guys that um, they wanted there, and they brought in a pretty um, inexperienced side and did a, and did really really well considering um, that you know it's it's a long trip for them and traditionally they don't they don't travel too well. So and I think just with the growth and how their game is going, you know, we talked around uh, Dupont, Dupont and you know the players around those kind of players that we haven't seen and been able to play them in France, it's going to be, I can imagine that the All Blacks uh, coaching staff and management and, and players will be replicating that, trying to get their replication of, of, a, of a Rugby World Cup. 
um, because it's a great opportunity to be over in Europe and you know, they'll, they won't waste any time around what they might look like for them because um, yeah, they are going to play France. You can replicate it to a, you know, a week of what it might be in a World Cup quarterfinal, pool play, a final or whatever, and you can kind of um, plan out your week or plan your training days for what they might look like. So I think the preparation side will be, will be great for them, um, playing their week of France and then the rugby itself. A French team that we've been really excited around, especially with how they're playing their attacking flair um, and bringing that flair back there, which we're used to be seeing, and especially a lot of those players as well that um, you know we hopefully get to see in the next coming weeks because I'm really excited to see where French, the French rugby has come due to their under-20s program and the success that they've had there and the, the growth and the development of those young players are now coming into that French side and um, it's going to be a great opportunity to see them in their backyard and something that hopefully the All Blacks can replicate and um, use that preparation like they would play in a, in a Rugby World Cup in a couple of years' time. A few, Jipper? Oh, look, as you know, Ross, I'm a bit of a codehead, so I could find an angle for any test match um, for, for getting excited. But, uh, look, it is the French one. Uh, I think everyone's hanging out for that. But uh, I, I think with what's happened over the last uh, number of years around um, the Irish test matches, I, I think that poses quite a lot of excitement. Um, you know, obviously, Joe Schmidt's not there anymore, and he seemed to... Uh, have a have a knack for uh, I suppose breaking down all black defenses and, and providing the Irish opportunities to win test matches so no doubt it will be another tight fought test but you know the French one sticks out for me um, but I'm certainly excited for the Irish test and to the Welsh I know they're, they're missing a few few players uh, but they are rugby mad like their their um, fans just expect uh, them to lift against the All Blacks, and as do most opposition. So, you know, those three tests are all going to be exciting um, build-ups for me and, and looking forward to watching them. Um, you look at the set, if you're looking at the Northern Hemisphere teams and you're looking at, you know, Wales, um, France and Ireland, you know, you look at the, around the success that the South Africans played, you know, the, the kicking game and even to the second, the extent of the second test, they ran a little bit more. But if you're thinking around um, a work on possibly as well that the All Blacks continue to, pos- to, to get a little bit better on, was the, the high ball work and being able to escort and be able to win the ball um, in that contestable mindset because it's probably going to come, it's a little bit more um, apparent in that Northern Hemisphere style and the number nines are really where we talked, we've talked around Connor Murray and then we've talked around um, the Welsh and um, DuPont and their kicking game and being able to put it on a, on a dime and so, you know, can the All Blacks continue to keep evolving and keep learning and being able to win those moments in there where you probably look at the South Africans at times in the two test matches, they actually won a lot of those aerial balls so I can imagine that Fozzie and the coaching staff and the back three unit will be able to you know, we'll be talking around how we continue to keep getting better in that department because in the Northern Hemisphere style, it's going to be coming. So um, it's going to be really interesting, interesting to see if they're going to make those adjustments that they um, didn't quite get right in the South African series. Don't yeah, underestimate, don't, don't underestimate um, a Kiwi coach. Like Wayne will have a plan mm. of how um, yeah. the Welsh are going to play. And, and I'm really excited also for Gareth Anskin coming back from a, you know, a, a injury um, to his knee and missing out on that World Cup when he was starting to hit some uh, some really good form. So, uh, you know, two sort of Kiwis that could potentially, one could be on the field, you know, driving the team game plan and the other one, uh, you know, making a plan. He probably made a plan a long time ago, uh, knowing Wayne. So uh, there'll, there'll be a few things. They'll, they'll chance their arm and, and they'll have nothing to lose, which makes them a dangerous threat as well. That's what I love about Wayne. That's what I love about Wayne, Jip, is that, you know, was fortunate enough to be coached by him a little bit. He will not. He will throw the kitchen sink at the All Blacks, and will. He loves a playing rugby brand of like you've been able to play a lot. So the, the fact that um they've got some great outside backs and consistent midfielders, um his game plan will be expansive. Yes, they will kick at times, and um it's the, one of their strengths. But you know what I really enjoy about Wayne, Wales and Wayne is knowing that he wants to attack. It's it's all out attack. So. Yeah, even though they are going to be depleted, um, it's going to be a great brain of rugby if they continue to have that um, expansive style that they have in the, the last couple of um, campaigns with the Wayne. It must be a bit of fun to coach against a team that you probably always wanted to coach yourself. Well, for, for a guy like yeah, Wayne well, Pivak. I, I, I think so. Um, but it could potentially be a stepping stone for him back here. You know, we've seen so many um, past coaches come from Wales and uh, come and end up coaching the All Blacks. And, Knowing Wayne as well, he'll have you know ambitions to do exactly that. Um, so having success with um, Wales, similar to I suppose um, Gats has come back to New Zealand to coach the Chiefs, and um, you know never know what opportunities could present itself for him back here with uh, New Zealand rugby as well. So uh, it, it's it 
he'll be fully focused on what what he's um, in control of now. Uh, but yeah, I, I just get a little bit excited, like as Bryn said, having been coached by him, he, he leaves no stone unturned and he um, is prepared to put it all out there. Uh, he's, he's not someone afraid of going all in. And speaking of the global game, the Club World Cup is again a talking point, maybe to start in 2024, fellas. <sighs> Bryn, how do we fit this in? <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love for it to fit in. Because look, you know, a lot of competitions, you look at um, soccer and football, you know, they've got a great, you know, the Champions League, the best in the world in Europe, you know, come together and be able to, and to play. So, you know, we have talked around a lot, um, you know, how can we make it fit? You know, hopefully there might be a window where we can fit it in, you know, whether it be, for example, June. And, you know, the kind of the things that I had a little look around it, um, um, around what that setup might be. And the kind of stuff that I have been hearing is that, you know, the ideal setup would be you'd have... The kind of Heineken Cup, you'd have eight eight teams that qualified for that Heineken Cup setup, and so the eight teams that are the quarterfinals would be eight teams that are going to be playing in that competition. Then you'd have four from the Super Rugby that make the semifinals in the competition, and you've got two from Japan, and then you've got one from the MLR, and then one from SLAR, and it's kind of sixteen team. It's a sixteen team comp. That was the concept that, that I read up. So um, I think it'd be it's, it's a great idea because look, I think um, we want to keep continuing to grow our game, and look. How many times have we had chats around, you know, would it be great to see the Blues or the Crusaders go play Toulon or Leinster? You know, who's the best Who's the best in the Northern Hemisphere? Who's the best in the Southern Hemisphere? It consistently as players, we always talk around that. The idea of us, you know, going and play at Saracens, you know, in a World Club final and being in a competition where we can play those teams and test ourselves and say, you know what, we actually are the best club in the world when we've proven it. And it's just not hearsay. So because there's so many debates around who's the best club, who is the best system or whatever. And, this kind of competition is really going to open up that avenue to, to figure out who the best club in the world is, which for, for a lot of players, we'd love to know as well. But I think the powers that be, there's so many different competitions, there's so many different powers that be that need to be able to collectively come together and sacrifice, you know, sacrifice and being able to um, put this to the world stage where we can have all these competitions, grow our product, and then being able to have a competition that is sustainable and being able to then to grow into what um, a lot of the competitions, like the Champions League Soccer, for example, which is a great competition, you consider the best in the world. Is that the right structure, Jipper? Do you think? Oh, look, I, first off, I think if everyone's motivated, and motivated enough, um, this, the calendar will take care of itself. And I, I think if everyone sees merit in it and benefit in it, um, there's, there's no doubt it, it should happen, uh, you know, from a fan's point of view, from a player's point of view, sponsor's point of view, you know, you know it ticks a lot of boxes um, and, and adds to a lot of excitement. I suppose in between World Cups, it would be it would be quite a pinnacle event um, for players to strive to get to. Uh, structure, I don't know, like uh, there's always the old adage of, um, you know, because of the Heineken Cup set up, it, it finds the best eight. Um, and it doesn't really matter where you're from, whereas it's, it's quite a hard task for the Southern Hemisphere to do that because um, you know not all playing in the same competition or have something of that effect. So what Bryn outlined uh, makes, makes sense. And I think if we are to grow this game, you've got to give other regions the opportunity to present something to their fan base and something to mm. get behind. So, so I think that structure would work on that sense as well. And if you, if you, you say if you're in Super Rugby and, and you miss out on the top four, yeah, I mean that is tough, and you don't get the opportunity to play at this. But um, you know the, you've got to weigh that up with opportunities in other markets and, and making sure that we make this a worldwide game that that we can grow its exposure and grow its fan base across the world. So this is played as a World Cup kind of scenario. All teams go to one country or a couple of countries that are close to each other and play off there for a month or so. Is, is that how you see it? And a, a, maybe a knockout tournament? Um, because obviously you don't have time for a round robin. Yeah, I'd say it would be like Bryn said, probably eight teams, eight, and you go straight to like a quarterfinal sort of, and it'd be seeded based on performance and who you'd play. I, I don't know the ins and outs um, and where it's mm. played or if some come to the southern hemisphere and some go to the north uh, based on rankings or whatever um, I, you know I don't know if it would be all in one spot I think there'd be a bit of travel involved and I suppose that's what the powers that be are working through now um, as I say I'm, I'm guessing but uh, those would be some of the logistical issues that would be presenting themselves yeah that's exciting it's very exciting oh, yeah. Um, like, yeah imagine, imagine it from a fan's point of view like it's just be such like good quality football, different styles coming. And I actually think it would be great 
for the growth of players in both hemispheres to um, face those styles at that level. Uh, because so often we talk when we're reviewing test matches that, oh, you know, that's not the style they're used to playing and, you know, this is the area they've got to work on. Well, it gives them another avenue to um, get a taste of that. But more importantly, it gives uh, a wider or a, a larger depth of the playing pool the opportunity to play against those different styles as well. You look at that as well, Chip. You look as like, you know, you talk around, so we talk around the Northern and Southern Hemisphere being able to connect and see who's the best. But, you know, that Japan League is really like the, the top two teams, the top four teams oh, that play in those competitions are really good teams. And you like to think, you know, we tried in Super Rugby to get the Sun Wolves together, but, you know, for whatever reason, the clubs wouldn't release them and they, wouldn't, they weren't really the top Japanese team. But, you know, you look at Panasonic and, you know, you look at Suntory. You know, those kind of two teams yeah, have, kind of great two players, teams have great players. Have great players. So, you know, if they can connect and be able to put themselves, a really great brand of rugby, into that competition, it just adds to that market as well. Japan is such a great market and it's a chance for them to be able to uh, test themselves against the best in the world. Mate, you've got to get a gig up there. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, mate. You deserve a gig up there. Give this man a contract. <laughs> <laughs> oh that is that is outstanding i i do i do agree with you but i mean, i know what angle you were playing there my friend tony no brown angles angle. here, mate. no angles here mate <laughs> i've seen the product for what it is beautiful oh, the, the, the japanese yeah. rugby mate love it it would fit <laughs> someone as fit and fresh as you Bryn. i tell you what you'd slip right in there at panasonic um how's that japanese of yours Bryn? You've got a little bit in the arsenal. <laughs> oh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't, actually. I don't. But I love the Japanese um, culture and language and have been fortunate enough to head over there. So beautiful country. Beautiful country. Yeah. Okay. Mate, this, goes got right in there. this goes straight in there, mate. You, you, you're knocking all the right boxes at the moment. I learned from the guy on my left. I learned from the guy on my left. <laughs> <laughs> nice very very nice uh, speaking of contracts internationally um christian lelia funnel what a great signing for moana pacifica do you guys agree yeah absolutely i i think it's um crucial to get some experience in a, in a i suppose a startup club and and you know it's about creating an environment that they really want to create i suppose um a filter of um you know pacifica talent uh, but that's going to take time and you need to create an environment and systems and values to, I suppose, set the foundation for that work to start. And then, you know, in a number of years time, um, they'll, they'll see the fruits of that labor that they put in now. Yeah, you can't just expect them to throw only players without a lot of test experience in there. You, you need someone to guide that ship, don't you? And, and as a player who's been through a hell of a lot of adversity, he's the kind of you know, settled head, Bryn, that they could use. Oh, yeah. Look, anytime you can gain experience of, of Christian Liliofano, it's um, it's so great. It's so massive for the program. And you talk around um, getting guys to be able to be, be competitive, getting a guy like that that, that, that just doesn't give you experience. It's his lifestyle and who he is as a person adds so much to that group. There'll be so much respect as soon as he walks into that building, knowing that like what his story is, how he conducts himself. You know, been fortunate enough to spend a bit of time with him. And, he, and first and foremost, he's just a great man and a great person. So... When you've got those kind of attributes, it's just going to be great for your club club moving forward. And so it's a great signing for them. And, you know, he's still playing some really good footy. Um, and, you know, even the likes of like Eri Enari, who we talked about, said that he might possibly be in there. I watched his game on the weekend um, against, um, I heard they play, they played, who did the Hawks Bay play on the weekend? Canterbury, mate. They did a Canterbury. <laughs> Canterbury, that's right. I'm Sorry, Canterbury. Canterbury. Canterbury, that's right. You know, and so look, you know, He's been he's been so good in, in that environment, and so you know, getting being able to have a nine and ten like that, and being able to connect those two together is going to be great for that um, for that group moving forward. Because anytime you can have a caliber of a player um, like Christian Lefano through the experience, you know, even Eddie who's been in the Crusaders environment, who's been in the academy environment, and he's been able to understand what it takes to be able to play um, be a professional rugby player. A lot of those guys aren't going to be in that kind of fold of being used to what professional rugby looks like. It's going to be a lot of guys that possibly might be in that Bunnings NPC or from afar in a distant um, in a distant country. So anytime you can have a caliber of players that like Christian Lidofano, Eddie Anadi bring into that environment, it's only going to make that group and that team um, that much more better due to the signings like those two. I wonder what that means for his chances of playing for the Wallabies. Um, probably, oh, it's probably a good chance to force his way back in, Jeffer. 
Oh, look, I, I think if he's got ambitions, um, you know, if, if Moana Pacifica perform extremely well in Super Rugby, just like Quaid, I think Dave's made it pretty clear if you're playing well enough, you, you, you'll be picked no matter age, status or, or anything. What, what's best for the Wallabies will be the, the deciding factor. So uh, I think the more minutes he pays and, and if he can put some runs on the board in terms of performances, why not? Um, and as you said, he's faced a lot of adversity uh, throughout his life, so I'm sure he, he's ambitious, ambitious to make every post a winner uh, for Moana Pacifica first. Um, but if the byproduct of that is a, an acknowledgement of a Wallabies jersey, then you know, so be it. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of getting back in the jersey, um, not the jersey we're used to him seeing, in, but Ma nah, Nonu on the weekend riding the horse away from east coast yeah. <laughs> and having a big win that was quite something um Bryn, like just such a legend oh it's so it's so good to see and it's just great you know when i saw the, that first post i knew that he was playing with um jose again i think they had a um an agreement that if you know Mar was going to play jose was going to play and so you know seeing two greats of um new zealand rugby and um that kind of heartland championship and especially with the um, amount of struggle that um the club's been through to get that win first and foremost after so many losses was great but you know for me the highlight was seeing him on a, on, a, on a horse riding out you know that just comes back to you know you look at Martin Non and what he's done in his career you know possibly uh, arguably the best 12 to come through this this country and in the world has played in different different cities different countries and played at such a high standard and then gets to come back and then give back to a community that um, you know, that's been struggling results-wise, but any time you hear about the East Coast, more Ngati Pirou, um, it's been able to see scenes like that. I um, mean, you know, I look back in my day when they used to have, when I was younger, you know, seeing the whole the whole um, crowd come on with horses rolling around after the game. And so it's just great for Heartland Rugby to know that those kind of scenes and those kind of pitches are still happening. And for a guy that's had so much experience and done so much for, for New Zealand rugby and on a world stage, to go back to the, to the Heartland rural areas of New Zealand and to see him riding out on a horse, um, yeah, it was a massive highlight for me, and, and um, you know, hopefully we can see more of those scenes in the future. <laughs> it was very good. It was very, very good. And you know, what is he? He's approaching forty now, and he still looks right at home, doesn't he, Jipper? Oh, absolutely. Uh, his kicking game was exceptional. Yeah, one kick, it was outstanding. Uh, um, and, and albeit, um, you know, it's it's about Ma and him going back because he, he's still currently playing. He's come from. Obviously, France back here, and, and um, I think last time he came back, he, he represented the Blues and uh, didn't look one bit out of touch. So he's certainly in great rugby condition. But Jose Gear yeah, looked great too on the left edge. Some barnstorming <laughs> run, and that classical <laughs> running style of his—it was, it was literally yeah. like reuniting the old band back together in a hurry. All they needed was a yellow jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Hurricanes might be throwing some at them because I tell you now, they could play good Super Rugby next year, both of those blokes. Oh, yeah. And, and Ma in particular, um, he, he, he's, he, I'd say he's still wanted around the globe, uh, what he can yeah. add. Like, and that just shows how much he still loves the game. You know, he's not looking to have a rest. He, he's going out and, and he's playing footy. He's keeping footy fit and um, any opportunity mm. he can play with... Um, you know, 30 people on the field, he, he's up for it, no matter the level, which uh, he's always been like that, hasn't he, though? He's always gone back to club rugby. Yeah. He's never, ever, uh, I suppose, not delivered at every level um, when, when, you know, throughout his, his time, even as an AB. And, you know, Jerry Collins is the same. They just love playing footy. Um, and it was great to see. And, and he certainly would not look out of place at Super Rugby. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> to go left field again, and because we haven't spoken NRL with Jipper now for at least a couple of weeks, so he's probably getting some sort of PTSD out of it. Um, <laughs> Benji Marshall, you both played with mm -hmm. him uh, when he was at the Blues. He's retired. What are your memories? Let's start with you, Bryn. Your memories of Benji, the stature he brought to that side, and, and the way he handled rugby. Oh, I'll never forget. I think, Jip, you can probably attest this as well. You know, we usually have our... During first first days of preseason, you always have your yo-yo test and your and your bronco test. I've never seen so many cameras for a for a yo-yo test ever ever in my life, and so it kind of just came to the magnitude of what Benji was at that time. And you know, we were fortunate enough that he signed at the, at the Blues at that time. And um, he was really open, man. He was really open and real honest around his journey. Um, look, he probably um, didn't want it, didn't succeed in the way he wanted to do, but you know, he was pretty open around there, knowing that you know I'm you know I've transitioned from rugby league into into rugby and. 
Um, I'm at, you know, I'm not, I am struggling a little bit, but he was always open and wanting to know and kind of had that growth mindset that I talked to a little bit earlier with some players that that was Benji to a T. He knew that his weaknesses and he'd be very open to the coaches, playing staff, playing group and saying like, hey, like, I just need this a little bit of help. Or like, what does this look like, um, you know, when it comes to rugby preparation? And so, um, and at the same time, he was, he was a great guy. Jip can probably attest this and he might have his own stories around it, but, you know, he was always a guy you could f- feel very approachable to. It was great for our young guys. Great for the young guys coming through. You know, I was young at that time, and you know, for someone that had given so much to the rugby league, and we all knew as like, you know, at that time, how much of a big star he was. He was never too big for us. He never had an ego. He put his ego aside. Never had an ego. And so, when you can talk to a guy like that, that kind of stature, uh, it made it comes back to his upbringing and how um, of a of a great person he was. So, um, yeah, I had great memories of, of only as was only a short time, but you know, what a great career. And I you know Jip loves his league, and so he'll be able to continue on that a little bit more. But for me. A world-class person first and foremost and then um you know a great rugby league player and very fortunate that i was able to spend a bit of time with him during um, that time at the blues yeah well i mean he touched me so deeply Bryn. I, I i managed to bring the nrl and rugby union together with a flick pass against canterbury behind my back similar yeah. to himself to Matt Daly. so you know it was um you know one of my big motivations was to pay tribute to him while i was still playing so I managed to do that which is great <laughs> um but um in all seriousness, um, one thing that um, surprised me the most is not his running fitness. We hit, we went to Ludus Magnus once, and, and it's like a it's like a body weight circuit gym, like ruthless sort of crawling and all sorts of um, you know I suppose fitness testers or gut gut busters. And and I remember he finished about fifteen or, or twenty minutes before everyone else, and it was his. His up off the ground fitness, you know how the NRO, they've always got to backtrack 10 metres and he was just incredible. Like all the body weight stuff and crawling and all that, he just absolutely demoed it. And I said to him afterwards, I said, um, you know, how, how, did you, how do you get so fit at that? And he's like, mate, that's all we do in, in the NRO. It's like that wrestling, they do the wrestle, they're always going the back, the 10. So they're so used to that, I suppose, that physical up off the ground burpee style um, sort of fitness. Uh, which which surprised me, and and then you know although he left early, if you look at some of his highlights um, for the Blues, he, he 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 was pretty exceptional, especially on that South African tour. Um, he set the up Lions some beautiful game. tries and scored one himself against the Lions, um, and 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 had his moments even when he came off the bench against the Highlanders. So um, he he certainly had a skill set. It was just um, I suppose. Uh, not the right fit for him, and, and he had an opportunity to go back to NRL, and um, you know he's still playing. Played a grand final this year, so it shows um, you know he still had plenty to offer um, at that game as well. Mm. Enduring um, players are becoming better and better at enduring long careers, aren't they? The way that they're looking after their bodies. You look at Ma, you look at Brad Thorne, you look at Stephen Donald, even you look at Benji Marshall. A twenty-year career is not off the cards. I think that's sports science. Um, I, I think sports science has really in, improved and, and enabled players to know their bodies really well. And, and, and I suppose this individual approach to weeks to get you be, the best out of you on the weekend has really come through in the S&C space. And, and, and they're getting the rewards from it because the balance and the knowledge of the player are being, are being considered when con, you know, constructing these, these programs for them to get the very best, because that's what everyone wants, isn't it? Everyone at the table wants the very best version of the players they're putting um, money and time into. And um, I suppose that collaboration and, and, and the growth in that sports science area of, of how to have that longevity, how to keep everything, um, you know, twitching at, at, at a fast level so that you can still perform at the highest stage has, has been a big factor. Yeah, I definitely reckon that that kind of that's changed over the years, Chip. That individualizing your program to like you as the individual. I think early in my career, a little bit on probably even to the your extent, Chip as well. Early in your career, preseason was pretty much you didn't touch well, a ball. Still at um, yeah, well, even more so in your era, Chip. You know, when you started, yeah. when you first came in, uh, you didn't touch a rugby ball from November to January. To the, to the start of yeah, January, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. So all it was considered like, all right, just mentally, it's real old school around, all right, we're going to try mentally break, we're going to do as much running with it. In hindsight, you know, it was probably a detriment to lower, lower um, tissue injuries in, in, the long, in the long run, you know? So 
I think the growth around sports science and being able to look after the individual and saying what the individual needs are, whether that's been bigger, you're trying to get a little bit put more size on so you're not going to run as much or vice versa. And being able to be a little bit more individualized, I think the SNC staff and the understanding of uh, GPS, heart rate, rate monitor and understanding where you are on the food and how you your um how tired you are, how fatigued you are, and recording those kind of results, it's leading to then being able to get more, you're more effective um, in trainings and when you are playing. And it's coming now. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, you look at Tom Brady. You know, he's obviously an outlier where, you know, he's gonna, he could probably play to his 50, 55. But, you know, like those kind of ideas around like making what's the best for you and what's going to get you to play more and being able to get the best out of you moving forward um, is a really indiv- individualized approach. And I think SNC staff and, and rugby has got a lot better in that department. And that's a good place to wrap the show for this week. Another Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Before we go, we'd like to once again reiterate our thoughts are going out to the family of Sean Wainui. Um, all the best to you all and all the best to his friends as well. So from James Parsons, Bryn Hall and myself, we'll see you next week. Matewa.